The following podcast is brought to you by cdkoffers.com. Use offer code DIESHRINK for 3% off everything on the website and Broken Silicon for 25% off all Windows codes. All right, on with the show. Welcome to Broken Silicon, a gaming hardware podcast. I am your host, Tom. And as always, I will let my guest introduce himself. Hi there, I'm Jonathan Clark. I work at a company called Richards & Electronics. Um, I've been in IT for almost 20 years now. Done a lot of different things over my time. Uh, I went to college, I did ICT and computer science. Worked in different fields of the IT industry. I um, I did electronics for a couple of years. Worked for a company that did HID controllers, uh, specifically for medical grade and military. And mm-hmm. basically, it was just trackables, keyboards, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we got into optical trackables at one point where I left. So I did a lot of that. Um, spent a lot of time soldering, testing components and things. Pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I went into different side of it which was like software engineering uh supporting it and it was mainly software for mail companies like ups um, fedex oh so you know software on pdas that they use for tracking shipments and things Mm -hmm. and from there i moved on to uh data analyst or it analyst uh worked a lot with crystal reports not sure if you're familiar with that uh create a lot of sql based reports the business I worked for, um, got a good understanding of SQL language, how to you know pull the information mm-hmm. needed. But it wasn't until after that particular job that I really started to get into what I liked or what I studied for, which was you know uh, managing IT infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and before I worked at Richardson, I worked at a company that was 100% e-commerce. Um, had like 15 different websites selling products and i managed the infrastructure for them and what does that even mean right for those listening like i manage the infrastructure like like maybe not a, a one hour explanation but for people listening what that what that would entail even roughly day to day like what were you managing so you know managing email mailboxes user accounts uh updates uh, across the board, you know, ju- not just Windows, but server updates too. Uh, maintaining the backup systems, um, anything that's in- like if something went wrong and then the backup failed, they would ask you why it wasn't working. Right, right. Okay. And for this particular instance too, um, this company we had offsite backup too, so I'd have to take a, a copy offsite every day. Um, not everybody does that these days. I think a lot of companies put push stuff to the cloud, but. Um, yeah, I mean, just day-to-day and stuff. Um, the last job I'd had, there wasn't really any other staff. The infrastructure wasn't huge, so I managed it myself. Uh, we did work alongside another outside managed service provider that assisted. And it was just um, keeping things up to date, really. Um, one thing that I did like about that specific role I had was when it came to time to refresh user and computers. Mm-hmm. and. The CEO of the company, <laughs> he was a penny pincher, right? He he looked at every mm-hmm. single cent that he could save. And so it was kind of a hard task for me uh, to do a refresh at a reasonable cost. Because every time you looked at, you know, your off-the-shelf kind of product, like from Dell or mm-hmm. HP, at the time, I think SSDs were kind of just making their way into the market. What what year was this? Oh, uh, let's see, it's like 2013, I think, 2012. Okay. And, yeah, I mean, they were kind of becoming standard at that yeah. point, I think, but not, you. I guess you would say they weren't universal. They, they yeah, weren't right. universal. You know, I, I don't remember seeing Dell or HP offer them at the time. It was kind of more of just third party, you know, uh, ScanDisk or other manufacturers releasing them. And they were only coming out in small sizes. I think 
one of the biggest sizes we had at the time was 120 gigs. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I actually custom built all the PCs for the refresh in that business. And I had, I had like a manufacturing line of, you know, all cases, oh. motherboards, CPUs, and putting them all together, putting them all together installing the OS. And we saved a bunch of money doing that way. And we got the best mm. that technology had to offer at the time. So, um, because one of the complaints that everybody had was their PCs were slow. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, but that's limitations of spinning disks. So, so yeah. Um, and then from there, I made my way into Richardson. Um, it's a global company. I actually spent two years of my time with them in the UK. So I, I lived most of my life in the UK, uh, but my mm-hmm. accent doesn't reflect that. No, I'm <laughs> sure a bunch of people are going, really? <laughs> Uh, yeah, then I came over here. I took over the position to manage the IT and just gradually, you know, worked it out, worked up the chain, and and yeah, I, I basically managed all the infrastructure for Richardson um, across twenty nine offices. I have mm-hmm. eight staff um, that report to me and do various different things within the IT department, and we've got a lot of interesting things going off right now too. So. That's pretty much in a nutshell, kind of my background. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure now is a much more interesting time to make purchasing decisions than it was 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. there's actual choice now. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of great new technology with good benefits out there. Well, and it's also interesting you said that you came to the conclusion, like, I will choose you know, the components we will use, and you know what? I'll just build them because no one's going to be happy for the amount of money you're giving me unless I do this myself. So you must have been in into PC gaming, I'm assuming, for a very long time before this. It's pretty rare that people would be willing to do that, right? Actually build it themselves. Yeah, so I, one of the things that's on my LinkedIn, I'm not sure you noticed, but I took over my dad's computer when I was like eight years old, I think eight or nine. And it was uh, Pentium 120 megahertz. You know, I had <laughs> little RAM in it. And I don't think it even at the time I even had a GPU. Um, it was later that I got into it, started messing with it, added a PCI graphics card. I even remember getting XP on it, uh, mm-hmm. which I felt like quite an accomplishment considering the speed of the CPU. But and it just it just went from there, really. Um, you know, I've always had a passion for it, and yeah, I liked computers too. You know, for gaming, grew up with a Commodore sixty four. Uh, mm-hmm. and just went from there. Yeah, I mean, I think, so if, if I'm hearing you correctly, you really got into like the PC hardware space because you got one and then you were like, how can I make this better, right? Right. Be- right. Which is what eventually got me into it too. Our, our family, you know, only had one desktop shared between the whole family and like it kept breaking during Dell's probably least reliable years in the mid 2000s to late 2000s. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people remember Dell computers from that time right. just straight up not working. And just it kept breaking. They kept sending components that were slower than the previous ones, despite them saying, no, these are actually better. Um, and just becoming fascinated with like, why doesn't this work well, right? <laughs> like, what can I do to make this better? And then slowly learning all of it. And then you just get to a point where there's, I would say a breaking point where you're like, ah, I'm going to build one myself. Yeah. And all those PCs from that era were all white boxes too. <laughs> That's kind of changed now. You know, you don't, you don't really see a white desktop case anymore. <laughs> Are those... The cream colored ones. I mean, may- I, I don't know. I mean, I suppose some people probably thought they were attractive because they uh, must have done it for some reason. But those like tan and vanilla colored ones yeah. with like the the uh, not the opposite of glossy. You know what I mean? Right. That like it's. I, I always look at those PCs like in my parents' basement now in their <laughs> old house, and I'm like, who thought this looked good? Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, even I mean, we laugh at like computers in the '70s for like putting wood paneling in them. But I'll be honest, I think that looks a lot cooler than that really cheap plastic yeah, look. I think they're bringing those back into fashion, if, you know, with the wood paneling and stuff. All right, so then I, I have to ask now before we go further. I mean, what what made you reach out? Because you you know you're one of the guests that reached out to me. Not, it wasn't that someone connected me to you or that I found you. I mean, what what made you? Well, yeah, what made you even be aware of Moore's Law is Dead and what made you want to contribute or have a conversation? 
Well, a few years back, um, when I was investigating uh, or pre doing the pre planning for infrastructure refresh for Richardson, I was kind of looking at all my options. And then I came across one of your videos. I'd already been watching you for a while, you know, before you gotten. Is there a chance you remember which one it was? I'm I, curious. You know, I, I'd have to look back and look for your video. A few years ago. That was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> but you were talking about um, Epic and, you know, when they're going to release and, you know, but basically what the platform had to offer. And it just kind of spiked my interest because I was at the time, honestly, doing the planning for a refresh. And we had Intel-based platform. So, mm -hmm. and the last I remember of AMD in the server market was the Opteron processors, and you know those didn't really have much success, to my knowledge. And whenever I always think server hardware, I always fought Intel for the CPU. Mm -hmm. And but you know you, your video kind of sparked my interest, and so I I went down the path of looking at AMD. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I, I watch your videos too because I like seeing the the updates on the the gamer side stuff too, the hardware for you know, like RDNA mm -hmm. and maybe Alder Lake. See what that comes up with this this year. So, well, I mean, it better be good. Or <laughs> let's not go into watch watch watch, watch my can the can Intel retaliate in twenty twenty one video people because uh, yeah, man, if, if Alder Lake isn't good at least. I, I, I don't know, but I don't want to get in. I don't know what's happening to Intel in the next few years. I don't want to get into it. You're saying you were watching the channel and it kind of got you interested in Epic. What what made you reach out, though, to talk about it? Uh, well, you know, I thought maybe I could use my experience doing the transition and maybe, you know, there's somebody that listens to your channel that could take benefit of it. Because um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, one of the things we can probably talk about is how people doing a refresh or considering any kind of infrastructure change when it comes to platform kind of have a lot of skepticism, I guess, when it comes to AMD. And I mm -hmm. guess it's rightfully so. I mean, they only have a small percentage of the server market right now, but it is growing. And I think, you know, people need to hear it. So, and, and, and we spoke offline you know, bef you know, this was the conversation I have with guests to make sure you're not just so raving lunatic. You know, <laughs> can, can you talk to me for two minutes straight? If so, okay, maybe you can actually be a guest kind of conversation. And and you were talking about how you know the server engineer episodes were very popular. Having someone on who's anonymous that just talked frankly, like why is are the things the way they are? And and you seem to have I wouldn't say contrarian views. I think it's not really contrarian. I think. Don't tell me if I'm wrong, but you understand where he's coming from and when he explains his decision making. But that perhaps some of those arguments maybe shouldn't. I don't know how would I put it. May like I think a lot of people say, well, we're not switching to AMD because we have legacy applications. We have a lot of infrastructure and support built up around Intel products, and that switching, you know, mass a massive base of this type of infrastructure to an entirely different platform is just a mountain of work. Even with the security vulnerabilities, you know, we we decided to just double the size of our Intel servers to make up for the performance loss instead of going to AMD. You you started bringing up the point of, you know, it wasn't that painful to switch. Right. Is what you said. Yeah, and I mean, I, I guess it like you had talked to the that server engineer before, it really comes down to the applications that you run. But mm -hmm. even if you do have applications that are legacy and aren't compatible with uh, AMD, I would at that point question what to do with those applications rather than not considering mm -hmm. a jump to AMD architecture um, for the simple reason of, you know, it's outdated. You know, you want to try and keep up to date when, when it comes to technology um, or software for that matter. So, yeah, I guess. I didn't think it was that difficult of a refresh or a transition. I mean, let's talk about that, right? Did you have any issues? Uh, like, I think you said you had probably a Haswell-based system yes. or server system, and then you moved over to Naples, so Zen 1 Epic. Correct, yeah. So no, actually, funnily enough, we had practically no issues, no, no issues that I'm aware of. If anything, it was all positive. 
You, you don't. Re- so that's it, it's funny because. A lot of my server contacts, when I talk about switching, they're like, oh, we're just, you know, getting ready to rip off the Band-Aid. And the, it's, I'm almost hesitant. It's not like I'm hesitant to believe you, but it's like, then I ask you and you're like, were there any problems? And you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're, we're mainly a Microsoft shop, right? Um, so we do a lot of SQL, CRM. Uh, we have one legacy system, but it's actually hosted externally. It's a, mm-hmm. a Unix-based one, but aside from that, you know, we've actually done pretty well to keep up with uh, software versions, so we don't experience any issues. But as far as I'm aware, any software packages that aren't compatible with AMD are very few in the little. Mm-hmm. So I'd be very surprised to hear from anybody else, you know, in the same position, kind of putting it off for that reason. Well, you know, I guess one question I might have for you, just just kind of like bounce it off of you, is how how much of the apprehension to switching, and, and I and I could mean like it doesn't matter if it's AMD or not, like maybe switching to ARM based servers, anything else, right? It could, but like how much of that apprehension to switch from Intel is an assumption that Intel's going to catch right back up in a couple of years, right? How much of it is well. You know, because I mean, I'm I, I don't I'm not I don't just want to talk about if there were problems after their decision was made. I'm also curious in what the process was in convincing management to approve switching to an entirely different, you know, set of servers. Like, was there any of this? Oh well, this is now. I'm sure they'll catch up any time now. Or an apprehension that AMD can keep innovating in the way they, you know, how much of it is people in your experience? assuming AMD pulled a rabbit out of a hat instead of maybe they really have just become a new company that's more competitive? Um, honestly, I'd say it was kind of not that much focused on the switch to AMD itself. It was at, it, in my specific experience for, for this refresh, it was more, let's look at the cost kind of, you know, basis mm-hmm. budgetary reasons. Uh, in terms of actually convincing C-level for the change, it wasn't easy. Um, I think some of my staff had a little bit of hesitation when it comes to AMD, just because, Mm -hmm. again, they haven't had much of the server market in a long time, if ever. And, Mm -hmm. uh, they're, yeah, arguably never. Right. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and, and their past kind of, uh, layout with, you know, with their desktop processors hasn't been the greatest, um, you know, and they came out. They were the first ones to come out with the, the high multi-core count desktop CPU, uh, the mm-hmm. Phenom, I think it was. Um, but it, yeah, Phenom, Phenom yeah, One. Yeah, it, and it didn't do that well. You know, the the, the no. IPC was Phenom terrible. Two was much better, but it was a little late, I would argue. Yeah, so I I think that's kind of left a little bit of a bad taste in the mouth when it comes to AMD, and so there is yeah, there is a little kind of hesitation in that sense. But I would say that we did our due diligence investigating it and we did actually trial the hardware mm-hmm. um, and we tested our own applications on it so not you know and how much testing was required because when i talked to the the what i again what i just referred to as the anonymous server engineer he said they had to do like two years of testing now that's in a financial i mean uh in healthcare so if they lose healthcare information it's <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very bad. They can be sued. You know, like, and he's, yeah, he said he had to do AMD servers for like one to two years straight. I mean, like, what, what, how long did you guys have to test and how many servers? I mean, we only tested two hosts running, um, you know, a handful of selected applications that we have. And we mm-hmm. did the test over 30 days. Um, mm-hmm. Now, that was just unique to us. Um, we do actually have contracts with the military and healthcare. So we, we have to live up to certain compliance mm. legislations, but you know it wasn't really that bad. The trial went smoothly. We, we didn't experience any errors or anything. And that was mainly because the hardware that we bought was all certified for you know, mm-hmm. running VMware and the applications that we had in mind. So it, again, I think it just comes down to doing your due diligence when you're considering mm-hmm. a transition like that. I wonder how much of taking that long to test do you believe is stalling? And how much of it do you believe is 
No, they just really have these procedures in place to validate. I would say it's somewhat stalling, but maybe not from mm-hmm. the IT department. I would think it's the, the executive C oh, level pushing back. Yeah. And then, you know, they just want to see more robust statistics or something, or maybe they're just stalling for budgetary reasons. I, you know, couldn't say. Well, and I think when it comes to switching between platforms, a lot of people listening, what I would say to you is there is so much involved in switching platforms that isn't just a specific thing from one team. Like when you switch to a new company to supply you, it's okay, whose names do I need to call up now instead of the old names? Um, what 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 is their payment terms? Do they pay within 30 days even? Stuff like that. Do they pay within 60 days? They say they're going to pay us within 60 days every time we order something. Uh, but it seems like they're not half the time. And sometimes it takes 90 days, right? Because I was a sales engineer in the automotive industry. And a large part of, you know, I was... I worked with Caterpillar. I was in charge of managing Caterpillar's account here in Peoria. And of course, you look at big Caterpillar machines, they have a lot of metal lines on them. But I worked for a plastics automotive company and convincing them to move from metal-based products to plastic, even though ours met the same temperature requirements, even though they actually typically lasted longer, even though they actually would, you know, they wouldn't rust. They had a lot of prob- less problems just by virtue of being a newer type of product. And of course, that costs like a fourth as much, right? Um, there was just this apprehension. And I remember getting on one of their highest running models of tractors, you know, our components. I think there were like two years of validation, tens of thousands of hours on our components. And it came to the point where there, there it, it was clear they were just waiting to see if anything would break for two years, right? That they had enough data that it wasn't going to break before then, right? right. But that, that's what it takes to convince people that are used to using metal, like, because we're Caterpillar, we're tough, you know, to use something that's plastic. I imagine that's the same for a lot of these companies where they're just like, well, Intel means, right. you know, reliability, you know? Yeah. I mean, Intel's, you know, the, the giant still on the CPU market. You know, uh, they have been for a long time and mm. uh, they had the server market. So, you know, Intel, um, sorry, AMD just came out and I think they're gradually just building up their reputation um, with people like me just speaking out from experience. And I know that a lot of their data centers, I think Stadia, it's not going to the cloud gaming yeah. portion, but they use, the Epic hardware. Um, yeah, and Vega. Yeah, and Vega. And I'm pretty sure there's a few other companies that I, I looked at that switched too. So um, in the link for the case study, there's there's quite a few companies on there. Which is in the description, guys. Yeah. So I think it's just a, a matter of time, you know, over the next few years that eventually I, there definitely will get more of the server market. I'm, I'm almost sure of that. Well, and I think to defend people who have apprehension and take their time switching between suppliers, like for instance, you know, from switching from Intel to AMD, I think there are real questions around if they can do it. I mean, it's not just, yeah, you made one server, you made one epic chip that on Tom's hardware performs well, cool. You know, can you actually supply me 10,000 of these a year and then like provide the correct support and supply chain? Um, You know, I think that's where a lot of the apprehension is too. And when you, when AMD's never really held this position in the market, I it is an honest question if they can do it, to be honest. Like, let's not act like people are idiots for honestly asking if a newcomer can do anything people have been doing for decades. Right, right. And so I guess let's get to a reader mail here, which you guys can submit if you support Moore's Laws Dead on Patreon. Manuel Nascimento writes in and says, obvious question, but how do you feel about the adoption for Zen 3 and Zen 4 on the server side? Will we see major adoption or difficulties in changing from an Intel platform to AMD? Uh, one will curb that transit or something that will curb that transition. So at your at this point, do you see, do you think AMD will more rapidly start taking server market share or do you think it's going to continue to be a similar grind? Well, here's the thing. Since COVID hit since last year, obviously a lot of companies have been financially impacted by it. Not, not everybody. Some have actually reaped benefits from it. 
Yeah. Um, but I would imagine IT departments, the company will have budget restraints. And when you look at Intel prices versus AMD, cost is clear. And the performance is also negligible. Pretty clear yeah. So right now. Um, so I would think there's going to be more interest in Zen, not just for cost, but for, for the performance that they're offering. And they've already had you know, Epic 1 and 2 out for quite a while and built a solid platform to just continue you know, improving and making that architecture even more solid. So I, I, yeah, I'd mm-hmm. say there's definitely going to be a, more of a growth. I mean, again, what I would say is unless Sapphire Rapids really makes an impact, um, I don't see how there isn't an on-ramp for them to start taking real amounts of market share. I mean, I think they're at like 5 to 10%, like 10% right now or something like that, which is impressive um, when they were at zero, right. <laughs> considering who they're competing with. But I, I think, you know, Getting to thirty is such a such a different tier of number. Like that's serious portions, and um, I I I I just think though that if you think they're gonna, and this is just me kind of speaking right now, like I do find it unlikely that they ever get above like fifty percent though, just because I think there are a lot of companies where it's the opposite of what you said. If there's budget cuts, they give they have more reason to just stick with what they know. Like you, like you said, though, right? I mean, am I wrong? There does seem to be this perception by a lot of management in some companies that IT isn't something that makes enhances your ability to work. It's just a box I need to keep checking, and these people annoy me. Yeah, that's unfortunately the way that IT is viewed in um, a lot of businesses. Um, but I think we discussed before that you know the changes that we made refreshing the infrastructure, not just the AMD platform, but things like moving to NVMe for storage uh, just increases the not just the capacity, but the efficiency of an end user, how they work. Um, improves their speed of being able to access files and pretty much across the board on all the applications. So there's definitely money to be saved in terms of time. Mm-hmm. It is interesting, though, seeing these core counts rapidly increase like this. You said that you had a problem where you were about... You didn't save as much money as you were hoping to because wasn't it VMware just all of a sudden <laughs> stopped charging per socket and just went per core? Just yes. making it way, way, way more tipped towards Intel? So one of the things we liked about Epic was, you know, with their future plans with Rome at the time, that... Mm-hmm. On the specific hardware we had, we could basically just swap the CPU from a 32 to a 64 if we wanted to for the increased core count. Um, Mm -hmm. But then at the time, obviously, I guess VMware caught onto this and realized that they were losing out on money. (laughs) Because... Yeah, you go from... Because this has never really happened before, has it? A platform that's like, yeah, now go from 32 to 64. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) before we, we weren't even getting close to 32 cores on dual Intel socket Mm -hmm. um so yeah single socket 64 core they were like uh no i guess we're gonna have to split this and make it as if it's two sockets so they altered Mm -hmm. the licensing and obviously that is counterproductive to trying to save cost um moving to amd but even so with the core count that high Mm -hmm. it's you know it's not that much more and you were also talking when we were talking offline about I do actually want to start going into some of the dangers of insisting on using legacy products. I mean, like, so Wooly writes in uh, from Patreon and asks, what is the cost, not in dollars, of changing platform legacy software hardware support? It seems like you didn't have much trouble with that, but I think that is an interesting question. Like, do you have examples of problems or uh, that have aro- arisen or co- like some sort of a cost to you or other people at the company because there was this insistence on in- continuing to use older, really, really outdated hardware and software. Yeah. Um, that Unix system that I mentioned to before. Um, so mm-hmm. before the company moved to Microsoft Dynamics CRM, there was a custom application that I think was developed over like the span of 27 years in Unix. And it was customized to the point that it did everything internally. And 
you know, the, the staff that had been with the company a long time loved it because it was simple and it did everything. Mm-hmm. And they wouldn't let it go because of historical data reasons. Uh, right. Although that, funnily enough, is being questioned this day as to whether we still need it. But for that reason, we had to kind of still support it. And Unix is kind of, it's not difficult to work with, but mm-hmm. the amount of data that was on there was sufficient enough to try and find a solution that wasn't you know, going to be hosted on our hardware. So we outsourced it. And mm-hmm. we have it in a cloud-based environment that's accessed through RDP. That's that's Mm -hmm. literally it. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's legacy things that you just can't do without the, the, you know, legacy staff, I guess, don't want to let go of. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I remember, I think I told you this offline, like I, when I worked at General Motors, like one of the tests we would, you know, when you're testing a car for safety before it launches, you slam different configurations of it into walls that really quickly. And to, or, you know, if you're managing the testing regimen, you're actually ordering the test from within the company. You're saying, I need you to, you know, test this many sides because we've changed this part of the seat or whatever, you know. And so you would order that from the tech center and then the testing grounds would run the test. And for whatever reason, the program we use to order the tests it was like a machine that's 40 years old, but you know, this is hundreds of thousands of dollars machine that slams cars together. Um, so they're not getting rid of that. And the computer program to use, I think, I think was literally built on and run. I mean, it finally got a GUI. So yay, <laughs> you didn't have to literally code each test. But it, it literally, I think, was running off of code that was written in mostly in the 70s, like in the 80s at least. Wow. And it I'm saying this was so painful, like you would click to open it. This is on a device with an SSD and everything. And this is like in 2015. And you would wait like two minutes for the program to open. And then once it opened, you would then, like clicking a box would take like 10 seconds. You'd have to click and wait. And then the box would appear filled. And there were like 30 things and then some notes you had to type in. And it's funny how... You know, this test was really only used by a few teams of maybe 40, 50 people, which at General Motors is a very small amount of people. Um, And so there was never this, you know, maybe we should (laughs) hire anyone to write a modern way of ordering this test. And, And so they just never did it. But, you know, when I really think about it, so what, there's 50 people? Like, I could have ordered that test norm using a normal document system now, like 10 seconds. And it took me an hour. Like, so what is that? 50 hours a month? Like, if you know, 50, you know, you almost wonder, are you really saving any time or are you actually losing money? Like, how much, how many, how much less staff would you actually need if they weren't wasting their time using these old programs? Right. I mean, I'm sure that's something you ran into with deciding to use an SSD instead of a hard drive, right? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I mean, it's, it's time saving. And then you also brought up the Solar Winds hack as well as a, Pretty big indication that we can't use legacy hardware anymore. I don't know if you want to talk about that because I did look it up a little bit, which is, you know, this massive government hack. And I didn't read that, you know, I, I didn't, you know, read a whole book on it. It is, seems like it was a pretty complex situation. But as far as I can tell, there was a Russian sponsored hacking of parts of the US government and it just was old systems and we didn't even know it happened until way later, right? Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, it kind of came a funny time because we were just about to deploy solar winds in our environment um and what is solar winds like i don't even really know i mean it's it's they do a lot of different things but it's mainly network monitoring um that we were Mm -hmm. looking at in specific um so you have a, a basically a dashboard and you can just go really granular into the network for monitoring purposes it's a very good tool for security reasons that's one of the reasons we wanted it. Um, again, because we have contracts with the military and the government. Mm-hmm. We have to have uh, strict compliance. For cybersecurity, we've been hit so many times with different things. We got hit a couple of years ago with DFARS, which is for the military. There was GDPR from Europe. Um, obviously, SOX. And so we just need to have tools in place. Um, Mm-hmm. And SolarWinds was one of the top ones. I've used it in the past, and it's it's really good. But Audit was actually the one that notified us of the government being breached through it. And the more we looked at it, the scarier it got. So we, we literally mm-hmm. just shut down the SolarWinds VM 
and haven't touched it. Mm-hmm. I think they've patched it since, but we just haven't got around to it. Now, I, from what I've read, there's still real questions about if these patches fixed everything they needed to because of how comprehensive the hack was. Right. They're not even really sure what they touched. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I wouldn't put it past them breaching it again. So I guess let me start moving on to some more reader mail questions here. Larissa Metz writes in and says, having just switched to a new CPU vendor, how long in terms of years and hardware generations are you certain to be with AMD? How long would it take or what would need to happen before you would consider making such a move again, be it to a different ISA or back to Intel? Well, I mean, typically the industry standard for keeping hardware is, I think, five, five years. So, I mean, we've had this new infrastructure for a year now. It's got mm-hmm. quite a few more years before we even consider doing a refresh. I guess it just comes down to what's available at the time and what suits us better. If AMD have something, you know, great, 128 core count, uh, you know, not that we need that much cores, but I would say we'd probably end up sticking with AMD. Um, Mm-hmm. depending on... Well, you don't seem like you have as much of a... Because this was another thing the other... The server, the anonymous server engineer said as well, that while there was this apprehension to switch, that they were likely going to. And once that happened, they're also just not going back to Intel for 10 years for a lot of their stuff. I mean, is that also... It sounds like you're a company, if, I, if I'm not wrong, that's also much more fluid in that way as well, that you'll switch right back but much easier than at least his company would. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. Um it comes down to our specific needs at the time and cost is the honest mm-hmm. truth. Um, and because we didn't have any issues migrating over, I wouldn't see any issues if we needed to switch back to Intel. Mm-hmm. So Evan Froelich writes in and says, how parallel can we make software? How, how, how many cores is too many? The point that you can't use any threads meaningly. 64 can't be the final destination, right? So it's funny, I bring up this reader mail because you just brought that up. Like, when would you stop? I mean, I guess you'll be in- impressed no matter how many times they double it. It's always <laughs> going to be, ooh, that's a bigger number. But like, at what point would you say, yeah, I don't care that it's a thousand cores? Like, what, what do you think that is? Like, if they go to 128 cores per socket, would you want to switch to that soon? Or would you say maybe not? I don't think we... Because I think you're still on 32 cores We're per on socket, 32 right? epic one, yeah. Um... Honestly, I think the maximum that we as a specific instance would need is probably 64. And mm-hmm. I, I'm at the point where I'm even questioning that move because even if you upgrade the CPU core count, you still need to have the other parts of the server mm-hmm. components to accommodate that, you know, such as storage and the rest of the I.O., you know, the network part. So it would be easier for us if we needed more compute just to add more hosts and we do that mm. with a fir- you know another 32 core chip uh, because we'd get the additional storage and that's all part of the VMware vSAN setup that we have so but i mean if we if we expanded to the point where we needed more capacity for virtual infrastructure then yeah i, I would think we could switch to you know 64 128 cores uh, but that w- about 256. 256, I think, is probably overkill for us. I think even 128 might be. Um, but certainly for you know your data centers, uh, the heavy computing. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I could see the use for it. And those are the big. Those are the big whale customers for these companies too. Yeah, right? they're the ones who want to buy the most, and they probably want. I mean, for, from what I've heard from talking to mega, like, you know, I'm seeing people at Amazon, mega data center people, they're like, oh, just 500,000 cores. Give me as many as you can throw in there, right? You're not one of those customers, like. No, no, we're not, no. Um, I, I don't see us potentially growing to that requirement, so. You know, let me ask you this, just like, because this is literally a question I, I'm just not sure about, like, I, what I was going to say is, well, at a certain point, we need to wait for software and the rest of the, like you said, components to catch up with the core count. I mean, it sounds like for you, you know, you're not the one that wants all of those cores, but at, at what core count do you wonder if their software is going to keep up? Because, I mean, their software is already highly parallel right now. Like, if you were spitballing, at what 
cores, how many cores per socket do you think their software would start to have issues, even though it's programmed for so many cores already? Uh, I would say anything past 64 at the moment might have issues. Already? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. That's just my opinion. I mean, I, I'm sure there's software out there that can utilize more. Yeah. Um, you know, s- some particular Linux applications will take all you can throw at it. Um, mm-hmm. I know C. Well, we say that, but that's because we don't have 1,000 core. <laughs> you know, well, that's true. Yeah. Cores yet. Yeah. It's kind of like the, the millennium kind of thing. You know, we switched over to the 2000, but a lot of things didn't support going over to mm-hmm. that date stamp, kind of like that situation. But I don't know if, um, I don't know what software developers are thinking in terms of uh, increasing core counts to optimize their applications. I really don't know. I, I haven't really looked mm-hmm. into that side. But you do suspect that even at a lot of these hyperscale companies, once we start getting past like 128 cores, it could become an issue. Yes, I do think so. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, like, and, and it's understandable. I mean, again, we've gone from, and just let's be clear, like five years, I think. I think around when Zen was launching, Intel had like 16 to 18 cores, I think, on the market. Um, I could be wrong. I don't even think they were to 24 yet. And now just, again, it's not even like five years. It's not even five years, just four years later. (laughs) Like we're not even quite to five years since the launch of Zen 1. (laughs) We we have 64 cores and we're talking about what what I'm guessing is going to be 96 to 128 cores Zen 4 or more. Like we'll see. Yeah. So Ian Clifford writes in and says, my question regards how their infrastructure evolved in terms of Rome and in the future Milan. How has the transition been, especially with NVMe, since NVMe over fabric is still in its infancy as far as I'm aware? So, yeah, I mean, NVMe um, was actually a big point for us to, you know, focus on because we moved away from your typical converged infrastructure and we had one gigabit network, which even by the time, you know, the standards of the time it was purchasing was kind of old. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had it all paired to a NetApp storage array. And the, I mean, the speed from that, even with 10K SAS drives in it, it just, it doesn't even come close. I mean, we're talking mm-hmm. 100 megabyte read write speeds. And so when we moved to MVME, along with the AMD procs, we were getting close to four, four and a half, five gigabytes a second for, for the IO. And, you know, I did this for benchmarks. So I looked at all those statistics. Um, and with the hyperconverged environment we had, we, we actually ran some uh, benchmarking specific to hyperconverge provided to us from VMware. And it was just night and day difference. There's just no other way of mm-hmm. putting it. Um, everything speeded up. I remember on the old infrastructure, it took like two minutes to get into Active Directory on Windows Server. Mm-hmm. And now it's like six seconds. It's, it, it's incredible, <laughs> the difference. The, the, the amount of time it saves us administering the environment is it's just crazy. You know, there's, there's a lot of gamers right now debating the usefulness of some of these hyper SSDs, like a classic fanboy flame war argument now is like how much it matters in the PS5, how much you need the fastest SSDs in a PC. But what I can say is um, outside of gaming, even for someone like me who doesn't really need the best, the difference I even noticed in using like, you know, NVMe 4.0 over a SATA SSD, even in RAID, right? It's... It's insane. Like <laughs> it's like the I can move multiple, you know, hundred gigabyte files between different things at once, and it doesn't get bottlenecked, right? right. Like that ability to do that, it, it's to the point where I have hard drives for like long, long term backing up the content I make in case I want to pull out old videos and cut things from it or something. But most of my backups that last for about a month or so are onto SSDs and. I did make the decision to just get like, you know, a few terabyte SS, SATA SSD, even just that over a hard drive backing up, like, you know, copying and pasting and seeing, you know, you will be done backing up in 30 minutes instead of five hours or something. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's absurd. Like, and and I think like, you know, there's things that can go wrong, honestly, if things take a long time. Like, what if the power goes out during the backup? Then you have to start over. You know, what if you decide you want to start doing something else, but you're only into hour three of the five hours of backing up? It, it's yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm wondering where it will go next, which actually brings me to a carbon Christ question here. And he asks, Gosh, Reese, why does Windows 10 Professional have to be so expensive? Don't listen to that, nerd. Listen to me. You can get all the great windows and gaming keys you need at CDK Offers. I have a plan. Go to cdkoffers.com to get all the Windows Professional and Microsoft Office keys you need, and games as well. Add them to your cart, and you can even apply one of them city slicker promotional codes like Dashrink for 3% off software and Broken Silicon for 25% off all Windows codes. I do have an account on this website, and it is ultra easy to use. Just submit your order, use PayPal, credit card, or Bitcoin, and go to Windows website to download Microsoft Professional. One more time, that's go to cdkoffers.com. They are a fantastic sponsor of Moore's Law is Dead. Use offer code DOSHRINK for 3% off everything on the website and Broken Silicon for 25% off all Windows products. Now, back to the show. Will 2021 be the year of waiting in D.C.? Next year promises great new products, especially Sapphire Rapids, and generally speaking, the introduction of DDR5, PCIe 5.0, and CXL 1.1, which should make for a big jump. Especially with 2020 being so crazy and cloud becoming more and more appealing, OPEX being more attractive in these uncertain times than CapEx, I just don't see a lot of traditional data center purchases this year. Oh, I see what he's asking. So... How do you see your decision making right now with DDR5? I mean, like, right, you know, they'll say, oh, DDR5 is going to be here this year. But in, in reality, it's next year, right? Yeah, I mean, in terms of adoption for it, I probably uh, at least a year after it's been out, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, and usually, you know, the latest RAM is kind of pricey. Are you going to make the bet that prices will go down? Because that's a bet that hasn't been working out well the past no, few years. No, I don't. I think if anything, they're going to go up. I think uh, COVID's made that yeah. pretty clear. Um, mm-hmm. And just the high demand for the stuff right now. Yeah, <laughs> I don't see that. I don't see us adopting it any sooner than a year after it's been out, uh, specifically DDR5. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you, do you think Carbon cries on to something that a lot of, these companies will choose to not upgrade this year and kind of wait and see what happens next year with CXL and Sapphire Rapids and Zen 4? Yeah, I would say so. I, I agree with that statement. Um, uh, as far as the, the comment he made about OPEX being more attractive, mm-hmm. I think that's down to a you know, specific instance, you know, preferences within each business. Um, for us, CapEx is more favorable. We we had considered going to the cloud, mm-hmm. but I say this to everybody that talks to me about the cloud. I, I neither love it or hate mm-hmm. it. Um, the cloud to me is just somebody else's hardware. Well, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's somebody else's hardware. Right. <laughs> when you move anything into the cloud, you're just offloading responsibility for managing it. Mm-hmm. Um, it has its, you know, pluses and negatives. Um, but I. I like using the cloud in a hybrid kind of configuration. Uh, we we mm-hmm. have, for example, Exchange in the cloud, Office 365. And that's great because I hated managing Exchange. Mm-hmm. And it's just simple to just leave it there and forget about it uh, and just manage the mailboxes yeah. as, as we need them. Uh, but in terms of like moving all of our infrastructure to the cloud, I at this point, I don't see it as being cost effective um, specifically mm-hmm. if we wanted the same level performance in the cloud you know oh, it yeah. would be tier one top of the range and it would cost you an arm and a leg each mm-hmm. month so you know for us it just wasn't right yeah i, I usually use things on the cloud uh, it, it's it's either ease of use Stupid, stupidly obvious ease of use and redundancy. It's like, do we really want to have everything in this one basket? Let's have some of our stuff for redundancy purposes managed in the cloud. 
And then at the same time, um, like there are just times though where it, it's like absurdly easier to just, you know, yeah, we'll let Google or Amazon manage this. Right, I mean, my right. God, are you kidding me? But but there are some things where it's the exact opposite, I would argue. Yeah. You know, I mean, for me, the major drawback of the cloud is you're putting your dependency on your internet connection. And you sure. And if you don't have a redundant connection, then it could be disastrous, specifically for you know a headquarters or manufacturing plant. Whereas, if you have on prem, they can continue functioning, uh, you know, without the need of internet. It's all internal. Uh, but if you have cloud based applications, it would possibly grind your business to a halt if you didn't have a backup. That happened to a lot of people at the start of the shutdown last year. <laughs> like a lot of people had their like. I remember the OEM. Uh, manager, IT manager that came on said that, yeah, there were some people they were working with where they couldn't do business for a week just because it was just completely flooded or they hadn't planned for if everyone needed to use it as once or vice versa. Yeah, I mean, I, Microsoft had problems, I think it was like uh, April, May time last year, where teams just went down because there was so much mm-hmm. traffic going over it. They just didn't have the resources. You know, mm-hmm. And it was it was down for like three four hours if I remember rightly, um, but that's another gripe that I have with the cloud. You know, uh, for Exchange they had they guarantee it for ninety nine point nine percent uptime, and sure enough, it went down last year. And everybody still complains to the internal IT department. It's just the way things are. <laughs> anyway, well, it's your fault. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know we can't do anything about it. You know we have just have to leave it in Microsoft's hands and let them fix it. But that's. I prefer to have the keys to the car than handing them over mm-hmm. to somebody else. But that's again, that's just my preference and opinion. You know, I was thinking about this. Like, how much chaos would there be if something overnight eliminated Amazon or Microsoft oh. servers? <laughs> like, how many web uh, companies and websites depend on one of those people? That it'd be like there'd be a day where you'd wake up and half of the stuff that you're used to every day isn't functioning. Yeah. Yeah, that would be uh, pretty disastrous to uh, to witness. Hopefully, that never happens. But you know, government hack has shown that. If, <laughs> yeah, I was about and, to say. Uh, I mean, if you, if you really not to give any um, malicious people some ideas. <laughs> I mean, if you really wanted to mess with the U.S., why are you hacking our government? <laughs> hack Amazon, right? Right. Like, can you imagine the damage? Though, I mean, like, how many? Uh, you know, people use or like even or Microsoft. If you brought down Microsoft servers for one week straight, I'm pretty sure like both Xbox and PlayStation gamers would be screwed because PlayStation uses Microsoft Azure for some of their for some of their game servers. Right. Yeah. Oh, it would, it would cause an absolute uproar. I mean, the mm-hmm. financial devastation from that. I I wouldn't even want to think about it. So if you're listening, Russia, you hack the wrong people, anyways. <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, Blake writes in and he says, since Ice Lake Xeon and Sapphire Rapids are all coming out this year, which one do you think Enterprise are going to choose? Well, so I'm going to jump in and say, I would have to check my last leak because even I forget sometimes the roadmaps I communicate in some of my videos. But I don't think Sapphire Rapids is like really coming out this year, right? (laughs) It's just what I would say ahead of time. I mean, I'm pretty sure they're going to paper launch it, but I would have to double check because some of that information becomes old and then you'll just... Out of nowhere, Intel and an earnings call will say, oh, now it's 2023 or something crazy. Right. But um, I, I don't know. I, I would say Sapphire Rapids is, they're going to try to launch it fully this year, but I would say it's probably going to be fully available depending on which source I talk to, probably mid next year, really, which is kind of right right around Zen 4 anyways. But I mean, what do you think about Ice Lake Xeon? I don't know if you followed that at all. Does that appeal to you? I mean, like I know it's going up to 36 cores. Uh, by summer, so yeah. I mean, I followed it a little bit. Um, I mean, Intel is finally starting to try and make some sort of traction on their side, as far as I can see. They kind of had the rug pulled under their feet from AMD, <laughs> but yeah. The thing that always puts me off Intel is their cost. They might have maybe a slight edge over AMD with Sapphire Rapids. I I really don't know. It's too mm-hmm. early to say. You're just skipping right over Ice Lake, though. You're like, there's no point in your opinion. I no, I, I, I wouldn't even, you know. It, it, I, if you ask me, that's like to answer his question about 
what I would say from talking to people about Ice Lake is that's really there to make existing customers happy with something that can be better than Naples. It's it's really not competing with Zen Two at all, oh. in my opinion. But but I'm sorry. Continue about Sapphire Rapids. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess we probably you know look at it in some respect, but I don't know. I've I kind of lost a little bit of faith in Intel, even from a personal level. You know, I. I ran a 7700K for a long time in my own personal computer. And I and mm. I switched to AMD just because they weren't really improving their product in any way. I mean, they stuck on 14 nanometer for the longest time. And it feels like now that we finally have competition from AMD, that they're starting to ramp up, which is good. But I don't see their prices ever going down. And that's just because I guess they they can charge that and get away with it. You know, people still buy their products at that price. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they, yeah. I mean, if you look at the ten nine hundred K, like even just in the gaming space. Um, to be fair, I've actually been told, just so everyone listening, that the top i nine from Comet, like they're actually not able to make a lot of them. Like they basically have to only make gold golden samples because otherwise they'll use like three hundred watts. Um, so, so I would preface this by saying. You know, they're not making that many of them, guys, because they can't at those yields. But that they are still selling out whatever they ship, though, right? I think their MSRP is like above 500 and it often gets to 600 or more, you know, whether that makes any sense over a 16 core Zen 2 for, you know, almost the same price. (laughs) I think people are just buying whatever they can get their hands on right now. I mean, well, yeah, sure, right now. I guess I'm mostly talking about five months ago, right? Like, so let's, let's just, I'm trying to remember what it was. So I believe Sapphire Rapids should be chiplet-based, 56 cores, have on-die memory, like a large package of it. You know, if they announce that, and that's coming out quarter four, and it really is, let's say it really is coming out quarter four with Golden Cove, all of that sick IPC and core and a core count almost as high as Zen 3, would you be interested in it at all? Or is there like no chance you'd look into that over waiting for Zen 4? Uh, no, I'd look into it. Uh, but I I would definitely look at the power consumption and the heat off one of those chips uh, for sure. I mean, I think it's going to use like 300 watts, so fair fair point. Yeah, so I mean, they're pretty power hungry versus you know the Epic chips. Um, obviously, I don't know what Zen Four it's going to draw, but I imagine that they're just improving it from architect you know jump mm-hmm. to jump. So I think it it's going to be better, and that was one of the factors that kind of made me switch over too uh, to AMD was uses less power. You know, it, it was just all positive when looking at it. I, I really can't mm-hmm. put a negative spin on it. You know, and I'm not a fanboy of AMD or anything. It, mm-hmm. it was complete You'd be bad at your job if you Yeah, <laughs> I would. You know, but the cost to performance ratio was just it just hit the mark right on. So I, again I'd I'd look at it the offerings. There's definitely instances where Intel has a better performance over AMD for certain applications. That is. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh yeah, there are some applications where Intel has a huge edge every now and yeah. then. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's a huge edge anymore, but there is an edge in some applications for sure. I've been told by a couple contacts. Yeah, I mean, one of the examples that we still have Intel-based uh, servers. Yeah. Um, but it's mainly for like simulation software. Like we use Ansys simulation, and that's using a dual core Intel. I believe we used gold rated ones. I can't mm-hmm. remember the core, core count. I think there's 18 core. Mm-hmm. Um, and just because the IPC and the software is better coded, I guess, for Intel than AMD. Mm-hmm. So they're definitely their use case, you know, they have their use cases for it. Would you be concerned, I wonder, uh, and again, I'm just curious, like about like Sapphire Rapids not being as good at some of those applications out of the gate, though? Because my understanding is uh, Sapphire Rapids is organized in a way, and again, as far as I'm aware, similar to Naples, where they have multiple chiplet and IO dies working together. Do you think they, would you be worried about them losing that edge, or do you assume they'll just keep that in those types of applications? Uh, it's hard to say because that's it's the first time they're doing the chiplet design, isn't it? On this, yeah, depending on how you look right. at it, right? They've they've had multi die 
things before, but in, in such a way like this, I'd say yes. I mean, Intel's so big that I would imagine that they have the support from software industry, mm-hmm. but I would I would definitely say it won't be without its issues for certain applications. Mm-hmm. Um, there might be a little bit of a late adoption from certain software developers. Yeah, and I'm also just curious, you know, like, if you talk to people about this type of stuff too, like CXL is one that I heard a lot about and, and talked a lot about in the last, was it the last? No, it was two guest episodes ago. I think it was episode 84 with Dave Eggleston uh, talking about Optane and how CXL is really the future of utilizing Optane well, which is funny because that episode actually came out a day before Intel canceled their Optane SSDs in the you know traditional SSD package. So I guess he's entirely right. I mean, are you excited about CXL? Like, it seems to me like it's kind of in between like DDR uh, sticks, you know, DIMMs and NVMe and capabilities. Yeah, no, I'm definitely excited to see what the, you know, the performance benchmarks are for that. Again, I guess I just have to wait and see. Okay, let me move on here then. Mia K writes in and says, I know for large-scale projects, switching from even Intel to AMD on the same ISA can be a challenge. Apple has proven that the ARM ISA can be made very performant, though. If Ampere or Nubia Qualcomm end up making high-quality and high-performance ARM server chips, what would it take for the switch to be worth it? I know many companies end up relying on shared libraries, DLLs, having ABI stability, would it even be possible for some companies to switch? I mean, would it be possible for you to switch? I mean, it's an interesting question. To to what? To something like an ARM-based CPU? Um, Yeah, let's say in three years, NVIDIA is done with their lawsuits for buying ARM. They successfully acquire ARM. They start making 200-core ARM CPUs. Do you think that would be something that you guys could definitely switch to for most of your infrastructure, or is there going to be extra challenges? I, there'd definitely be challenges for sure, but I think we could probably take a good chunk of the infrastructure and migrate it to something like that. Um, I mean, Microsoft is no stranger to ARM-based CPUs, so they already have a Windows operating system that runs on ARM. Mm-hmm. So I, just a question of adoption, I guess. I know ARM already has server hardware. They do, So yeah. I don't know. I mean, it all depends on trials and testing and making sure everything would run on it. But if it's been anything like the switch from Intel to AMD, then I definitely wouldn't rule it out. So uh, at least you're saying, at least for your applications, you don't believe there would be this roadblock going from x86 to ARM. You you went to AMD because it was the best in general, not because it was the best x86. Correct. Yes. Okay. And do you think how many, I guess, I, I don't know how many people right you network with and talk about with this stuff. Like, how do you believe that most companies would be fine switching to ARM? Or do you think a, like half of them just can't? Uh, I would definitely say half. Um, okay. Just from knowing and talking to some other techs, you know, that manage IT or server engineers that I've talked to. I think ARM has mostly been great for the mobile market, but for mm-hmm. the mainstream server industry, I, I'd be a little hesitant, I think, to say that any more than half without issues, or even the half that would be able to switch definitely would still have issues, I think. Well, so let me ask you this then. I, I just know some people, even some tech tubers, I seem to have this, in my opinion, perception that eventually ARM is going to conquer everything, that it's better than x86 and everything. Do, do, have you ever found this to be your experience? Do you see ARM replacing x86 anytime soon? No. Uh, at least not for the near foreseeable future. I think x86 still has plenty of life in it. I don't see Intel or AMD going anywhere, you know, hanging up the gloves anytime soon either. But that's what it's mostly about, right? It, it, and that's what I keep. Con- that's what what I believe you're saying is something I convey. You know that I used to think, yeah, maybe ARM is the future or something, or maybe Risk Five is. But who's making these ARM or Risk Five chips? Because from where I'm sitting, Intel and AMD continue to make the most powerful processors by a large margin most of the time, and that because of that, x86 is probably here to stay for a very long time. I mean. 
Th- that's what you're saying, though, right? It's yeah. You're not even really buying x86. You are using x86, but it's because it these CPUs happen to use them. right. That's that's pretty much okay. dead on. Yeah, and I guess with ARM too, I, I I'm not sure if it finally went through or not, but Nvidia is supposedly acquiring you know acquiring them, right? So be interesting to see mm-hmm. what they do with them going forward. Um, I've heard whispers they do have plans to try to make like desktop gaming chips <laughs> eventually just to get in there. We'll see if they work well, you know. I mean, they're not always a success over there. Like Tager was really just kind of given away to Nintendo <laughs> eventually because they couldn't get it in anything else. Some pe- if some fanboys wouldn't want to hear me say that, but it's, it is what it is, guys. Tager just wasn't. <laughs> yeah. It's in the Switch because it because they got it for about $5 per APU based on what I'm... <laughs> But uh, let's move on to another one then. Carbon Cry writes in and says, will System Z, Z System, IBM Z ever die? I'm not really familiar too much with that specific offering from IBM. But Mm -hmm. generally speaking, anything IBM tends to last quite a long time in terms of Mm -hmm. how long they they keep a particular product line out. I, I, I really don't have an answer to that one. Did you look at IBM for switching? No. Uh, well, I mean, Lenovo is technically IBM. Um, so we did look at Lenovo. Uh, the, mm-hmm. the other platforms we considered were Dell, Cisco, NetApp, and HP. But ultimately, and I guess this is something I haven't actually talked about, we ended up going with Supermicro. And that, yeah, a lot of people do. Yeah, and I, I think Supermicro honestly don't get enough attention that they should do because they're not one of the main brands of uh, server hardware. Mm-hmm. But one of the things we really liked about them was the flexibility and amounts of different platforms that they have. And they were one actually one of the first ones to partner with AMD mm-hmm. and support their Epic line. But we just liked the fact that we weren't getting any of the, you know, the software that Dell puts on their servers, for example. Um, I think call it kind of bloatware on the desktop side, but on the server side. <laughs> yeah. um, and you pay a price for that, you know. I remember looking same exact spec. So that's there on the server side too. They have bloatware. Yeah, they they put that. What? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, but I remember looking at the same price for the same configuration versus Super Micro, and it was like mm. seven, eight thousand dollars difference. And I'm like. I know they do a lot of uh, pre-testing for compatibility on their accessories, but it Mm -hmm. does kind of limit you to what you can customize the host with. So ultimately, we went with Supermicro for not just the cost reasons, but for the flexibility. The one thing I Mm -hmm. will say, anybody from Supermicro listens to this, your support sucks. (laughs) (laughs) I, I would imagine at least one person does. All right, I, I, this is a pretty interesting question here. It's something that I used to talk about a lot, but I don't think was brought up for, for over a year on the channel. But Abraham Fatih, Fatahi writes in, I hope I said that right, it says, Hi, Tom and guest. I posted this for a while now that chiplet technology should allow for more customizable products to the demands of consumers by making it cheaper for a consumer to essentially choose all of the blocks of a given product. For example, if every component in an SOC was chiplet based, one could choose how many cores, how many groups of processors, how many specific ASICs, stacks of memory they want, and then custom order a CPU to their liking. Do you? This could entirely change how the PC platform is handled and perhaps change the entire industry. Do you think this is the direction AMD is moving towards? Uh, or do you think they mean to make the parts cheaper for themselves and maintain the status quo of how a PC is designed, i.e. standard CPU and discrete GPUs and motherboards? How long do you think it might take to achieve this? And do you think anyone else is going to attempt this in the industry? Wow, that's definitely a lot to process. Because <laughs> I think I've done a video on that, and I think I talked to, I don't remember which broken silicon it was we talked about, but like, yeah, I mean, like at a certain point, theoretically, couldn't you order... An APU like a hamburger? Couldn't you go to AMD's website and say, "I want this eight-core chiplet at these yield, you know, at this clock speeds, you know, th- so these good of a yield, and then I want this much stacked memory, and I want a GPU on board, or you know, I don't need an onboard GPU for this, you know, and so on and so forth." 
Maybe you could even say I want a four channel memory controller or not. Yeah, I mean, to have something that customizable would be. I, I could see the benefits. You could custom order whatever Naples thing you want. You could even put the GPU inside the chip if you just want a 24 core and then put like, you know, a GPU block in there instead. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see the benefits of that. Whether it actually is going that way, I don't know. And I, I would say maybe not just because I don't think there is enough demand for that or the costs involved to support that kind of manufacturing, you know, customization and rollout. I, I really don't know how that would work for for companies. I mean, I know... If, if you had that option, though, you'd probably love that, wouldn't you? For me, yeah, because I'm an enthusiast and I'd love to be able to, like, specifically pick what, exactly what I want in my CPU. Would you be likely to do that for the servers for your company or do you think you'd be more likely to just choose a standard package that meets your demands for the right price? I would probably just choose a standard package. Yeah. I'd mm. say if we had a specific field or we were in a, even more of a specific industry business wise, then maybe, yeah, I would look at a customized CPU. Yeah. It's, it's something where it's kind of like a chicken and the egg thing, you know, with another factor of cost involved. I mean, to get to that, I think what a lot of people might not think about is to get to that type of a situation where you can literally order your CPU like a hamburger, AMD would have to know exactly how many of each to make, mm -hmm. right? And like, and they might not know ahead of time. They might not know which ones are going to be the most popular, you know? Like, I think, I think for example, like with Renoir, from what I've been told uh, by some of my contacts that like analyze sales is that in fact, they're shipping like a, a fourth of them or something are the six core. No, no, I think it's like 40% of them are the six core model. And it's like, this is a small die. There's no way they need to disable that many cores on them, but they're just forced to. Wow. <laughs> and that a large reason the top six cores or most of the six cores from Renoir are so much more efficient than the Intel ones is because they really could have been eight cores and they're disabling the least efficient cores. And so if they ever got to like a high enough volume of sales, that actually some of that mid-range of their APU lineup would lose some of its efficiency advantage over AMD, you know? So like, yeah, so like to have a, a, a cafeteria system you would like literally have to have ahead of time this many of each thing people will order. And then if someone does a large order, that's not there anymore. I just, I, I don't know. The way they designed their lineups is mostly around what they can even make anyways. Like they couldn't even customize it. I, I think, I don't know. I think long-term this could be a thing, but I would almost think it would be like for like enthusiast laptops. Mm. Like I think that's the customers that would want this the most. I don't know. So you're saying you probably wouldn't even want this for your company for servers, right? No, you probably wouldn't use it. No, I, I just don't see. I, it would come down to cost, I guess, and availability, and if we needed something specific. But for personal use, I could definitely see myself going that route. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, what I've always wanted to see in terms of technology in the future is maybe consolidating. PC hardware even more, kind of like hyperconverged is done for the server environment, and just do away with the graphics card, and maybe even have a separate socket for a GPU, uh, which I know has been proposed, proposed and there's reasons yeah. behind why it's difficult to do, uh, you know. But there's definitely potential for performance gains by, you know, not having to use PCI, for example, you know, making things direct, that kind of future technology would interest me if it ever did come out that way. I think, and let's just kind of move this conversation over more and more than to the PC, like our thoughts on PC gaming stuff, because I, I have a lot of people ask me, you know, well, now that, it, now that NVIDIA's launching 350 watt plus graphics cards is this the future you know is amd going to make 400 watt ones and i think the short term answer is actually maybe but long term i don't really see 400 watts ever being the standard first of all you're just doubling the cost of the board more maybe more than doubling the cost of the board and the cool and easily more than doubling the cost of the cooling for these components. So it's like, it's just so much less efficient from a cost perspective to do that as well. You're like, you're doubling the cost of the overall product for what, 20% more performance at most. Um, 
And then it's bigger too, so it costs more to ship it. But I, I really think that if this would have been an initiative 20 years ago, the actual answer is yes, because we were just n- node shrinking so fast and latency wasn't as much of a factor. Like if, if NVIDIA could have made a 1,000 millimeter squared 40 nanometer card, they would have. <laughs> right. <laughs> For sure. And it would have been awesome. Right. But moving forward, I think a large part of this is latency. And the bigger and fatter you make some of these things, like actually you're not going to gain that much more performance. That it is a lot, even though we are getting to this point where we can make giant things all of a sudden with these huge monolithic dyes, I think a lot of it's, I think the bottleneck is latency a lot of the times now in a lot of gaming applications. Like even just some, these are edge cases, but some interesting tests between like, the current gen consoles uh, and some things on PC. And there are some CPU benefits to older games they've run. Like I think Crisis Remastered on the PS5 simply because of less overhead, less latency. Like at a certain point, the way to scale performance is going to have to be latency, On I think. Like we just can't keep making things bigger because it's it's not that we don't want to. I'm just telling you, like it's not it's not adding performance, guys, when we make things bigger anymore. Right. And I, I think that's where they've started to innovate with technologies like smart access memory, you know, between mm-hmm. the CPU and the GPU. Obviously, AMD did their, what's, what's it called? The cache. <laughs> I forget what it's called now. <laughs> oh, I mean, well, I mean, on Zen 2, they called it game cache. And then on uh, RDNA 2, they call it infinity cache. That's it, infinity cache. Yeah, I couldn't remember what that specific word um so yeah i mean i i agree with you i think that the power hunger is probably going to creep up a little bit more than what it is right now but it has to be capped off at some point because i mean Mm -hmm. i think the biggest power supplies you can get are like 1200 watt i mean at what point for for any reasonable price or volume yeah yeah i mean i'm pretty sure there is 1500 watt and then of course if you use you know european power Systems which can support more. I think those get up to eighteen hundred, but it's like platinum plus plus. It's like titanium rated. Yeah, like these are like five hundred dollar power supplies, guys. Right. I mean, I see a you know a trend in what AMD is trying to do with each revision of RDNA. They're trying to obviously improve performance and also cut the power. So, but I mean, I guess that comes down to the manufacturing process, and I how far they can go down to the point where they just can't squeeze any more out of it. You mm-hmm. know? I mean, if they get, if and when they get to two nanometer, for example, mm-hmm. like, it would be interested to see the power draw from that, and how much power they can squeeze from it in terms of performance. Right, because we're at like seven right now. We, we'll be at five by next year, and then three a couple years after that. Like by 2025, we're talking about we could have 4x the density. It's like, yeah, what happens when we have NVIDIA cards with, you know, 40,000 CUDA cores instead of 10,000? Right. <laughs> like how much, how, how bad is the heat density issue going to be? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're 30, uh, the 3000 series is pretty toasty from what I gather. Mm-hmm. I mean, I haven't been lucky enough to get hold of one, but from what I heard, from, just from the power draw, they, they get pretty hot. Oh. Well, and I know they've broken some power spikes. I think people miss uh, uh, that. Well, it's maybe 350 watts on average while you're gaming that there are amperage spikes to like, <laughs> like, like there's a reason they put the 12 pin on the launch models, guys. It's because the amp spike can, it can spike to the equivalent of 600 watts. You really do need a 1000 watt plus power supply for those 30 90s. Yeah, the yeah, the thirty ninety definitely is power hungry monster. I don't know what the. And to be fair, the Fury did that as well, and AMD's certainly had cards like Vega Liquid that do that. Yeah, the, the Fury what, that was a dual GPU design, wasn't it? Well, they did have a dual version of it, and but then they that yeah required that actually wasn't that bad, but I think it was really mature. But like the example I bring up which is something I brought up with a guest I had on a, a year and a half ago or something. Uh, he custom made ITX cases and I brought up the Fury Nano and he's like, well, that card was great, but you really needed a 500 watt power supply. It's like, don't get me wrong, it used 200 watts, but it is an underclocked Fury X. And so its amperage spikes would like turn off power supplies. And I knew he was right because it had happened to a PC I built for someone else <laughs> in an ITX rate. Right. 
So yeah, just because you see a certain power usage with these newer graphics cards, I think they overcompensate with what they say the re required power supply is. I do think it's overkill. They're just covering their bases. But make no mistake, you, you're not going to fit that 3090 reliably in a 500-watt power supply. I'm no. Just, no. I'm here to tell you guys you need at least, at least 750, and I've heard it break those too. <laughs> but moving back to the main subject, I mean, I agree. I think eventually for latency reasons, because again, people, when, when there's more latency, you're wasting joules of energy moving data farther distances. Like which creates heat, which lowers performance. I I could see a situation where we, where whether you like it or not, I think this is a spiel I did a year ago. Like, yes, there will be a high end graphics card that goes into a slot for the super enthusiast, but I could almost see it get to a point in five years where the highest end APU, if AMD really did make a three hundred watt APU or something that's like Threadripper sized, that that could be 80% the performance of literally anything NVIDIA could make in some giant card just because of the latency advantage it has directly communicating with everything next to it. That we're going to get to a point where, and you can see the PC market already turning into this, to be honest, where everything is fairly reasonably priced up to about a certain point, and then it's like quadruple the price to get 20% more performance. Yeah. yeah. There's but they'll find some weird software system to make you, you know, like DLSS 5.0 or something, well, they'll argue, oh, but it's really double the performance. <laughs> yeah, I can see that happening. All right, so let me move on to... I mean, I'm just going to throw this at you because I know you're a gamer. So Wooly writes in and says, how much downward pressure on the complexity of games is the cons our console controllers imposing? Um, and I actually want to answer first because I'm going to be honest, a lot of PC games I play do nothing with the keyboard. Like, so I swear some PC games, they're using, they're really not even well mapping out things themselves anymore. I do feel like it's, it's become almost a crutch of how many buttons are on the keyboard to where they'll just throw it all over the place and it's almost impossible to play the game. But so I don't know, maybe you disagree though. Like how much do you think controllers are holding things back in terms of like controlling games? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the, the DualSense 5 for the PlayStation has been... Uh, pretty cool. Uh, if, Have you had a chance to try that? I've held it in my hand. I haven't actually tried okay. it in any specific games. Again, it's one of those things you just can't get hold of right now. I think the the controller, I don't think it's holding too much back. They're trying to make it more realistic in the way you know you feel sensations when you're pulling triggers, for example. I guess it depends on the games. Um, mm-hmm. I think for specifically for racing and shooters, they're pretty they're pretty good. Um, but I, I mean, I think the bottleneck is creativity, honestly, because like even when it comes to controllers, I think ninety nine percent of games don't do nearly as much as they could with even a controller's control schemes and like being creative. I would say where the controllers are still lacking is in the VR space. Probably, yeah. Yeah, I have an Oculus Rift S, and. I've tried the the Steam one. I can't remember what it's called now. And just the controllers is, is so much better in terms of like how they articulate your fingers. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's more realistic. I think there was talks about some uh, Facebook was developing some sort of glove system for the Oculus. I mean, that's you know what you see in futuristic movies. That's the idea, right? Yeah. Or well, honestly. Uh Actually, the, the ideal system, I think, in the future would just be some kind of bar that scans your movements in a much, 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 much more sophisticated way than Xbox Connect did. <laughs> and you don't need to put on any gloves. It can just see how your hands are moving. Yes. That, That's how it should work. That would be very cool. It could do mm -hmm. that. Um, and then if you want to put on gloves so you can feel vibrations, cool. Kind of like a form of augmented reality. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing, but reversed in some way. But I mean, like, as an example of how I feel like devs are like crazy lazy, some of them are not being as creative as they could with like controls. I mean, can we just talk about how bad game menus are now? Like, <laughs> like some of them are like absurdly lazy. Like, I like the, the perfect example for me is like Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And I assume it's the same in Valhalla, where for some reason on both console and PC, you control this like moving little circular disc around the menu to click on things, even though you're using a controller. So why don't I just use the buttons? You like control it on console like it's a mouse, 
but it's sluggish. But then also on PC, it's sluggish because it was built for a controller using this bizarre hybrid of mouse analog stick controls. Like if that's how bad the menu is, I don't, I don't know. You're, I, I, I'm really not convinced that controller or keyboard and mouse or anything we have now is actually holding back 90% of games. I really think they're just kind of phoning it in sometimes with how we could manipulate things. I, yeah, I can kind of see that. I mean, it's, they're trying to design for cross platform. Um, mm-hmm. And I think for quite a while, consoles kind of held the high part in the market for games. But I've seen mm-hmm. now that PC gaming has become more prominent. Specifically with Microsoft, with everything you can get on Xbox, you can get on PC. Yeah. And it runs better in most cases. So maybe, yeah, like you say, you know, you get the mouse and pointer on the console, it it doesn't take them that much effort to make the D-pad move through the menu. (laughs) Yeah, like, but they can't even bother to do that. Or they'll have a game, like, there are more games than you'd think that let you just plug in a keyboard and mouse, even on PlayStation in addition to Xbox. Um, you just got to look for it. it. It's actually, it seems like a lot of them do now, but yet you'll still run into games on both platforms that don't support both. And it's just like, yeah, like you, you, you're, you have a hard time convincing me this game wasn't playable at some point with keyboard and mouse while you were developing it too. <laughs> Why? It just let me use it. I think the one that uh, kind of frustrated me is uh, playing the Sims on a console. It, it to me, oh, it, I've never tried that. It doesn't oh, I, I work. think I tried it once, like, when I rented it from Blockbuster in like <laughs> elementary school for PS2 or something. I don't think, yeah, I haven't tried that since then. I, that's a game I would definitely be playing on PC. Yeah, it's, not, it's definitely not designed for consoles. It's, it's a point and click game. And I'd say like most of those strategy ones, like for example, Age mm-hmm. of Empires or Command and Conquer, they're best played on PC. Um, oh my God. Yeah, it's not even... Yeah, <laughs> I think there probably could be effort put in to make it work well. Like I saw some RTS games that tried to do it well with like a PlayStation Move or a Nintendo Wii controller. Like that could work where you can like point, but yeah. it's almost like what's the point? The player base is on PC anyways. Also, just let us plug in a keyboard and mouse. <laughs> yeah, like for Christ's sakes, guys. Like problem solved. But uh, let me move on to the final questions here. So. Valko Malev writes in and says, first of all, I want to ask you, what is the best way to progress in my career of a programmer? What is the one thing that is most commonly neglected? What advice would you give me besides improving my social skills, of course? Uh, so in terms of like between the Cisco and the Comp ITA, I would definitely say the Comp ITA is better, but it comes down to what you want to do in terms of your career. If you want to aim towards more the network portion of things, then Cisco is the way to go. But if you want a broader overall knowledge of IT um, in general, then Comp ITA is it's great. And Comp ITA has specifics too for networking. If you wanted to expand it, um, I, I did Comp ITA uh, quite a few years ago, um, and it's it served me well. Uh, I mean, after you take it, you just really, really just have to keep up with technology as it comes out. Um, mm-hmm. Because like with everything in IT, the moment you buy something, it's out of date. You know? Yeah. Um, there's always something in development newer or something about to come out. And you just got to keep up to date. So, um, Well, I mean, on that note, I did see someone respond to him on Patreon that just don't let your skills stagnate in general. Right. And, and I think that's something that just because of my nature, if I don't feel like I'm learning something new or I'm not challenged or, or you know, if I'm not having trouble sleeping and keeping up, then I'm not happy. Like that's just who I am. But I think there's a certain advantage just in general, living a little bit like that, where if you're doing a job and you really haven't learned anything new, like if you're starting to go to work and phoning it in, like you're working half as many hours, but you're getting more done is I think that's when you need to consider maybe you got to add something else on top of there too. Mm-hmm. Right. Like always make sure you're learning something because you can see these, I'll speak for myself. I can, I've seen people I work with where they never, they just kind of at a certain point stop <laughs> learning. And then it's like, well, then that's when they stop doing anything new too. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And then, you know, specifically in IT, um, mm-hmm. it's ever evolving. 
not just because of technology, but because of cybersecurity and these hackers. Yeah. So, I mean, I've seen in the last couple of years, a lot of cybersecurity firms just come out of nowhere, you know, offering services. And there's a lot of qualifications now out there specifically for cyber, you know, security. Um, that's definitely a, a good career path to take too. Uh, and there's, yeah. there's parts of that in networking and there's parts of that in uh, just managing overall infrastructure, but it's something yeah, I don't I've see cyber secure. Yeah, I don't, I don't expect cybersecurity to be a, there'd be less demand and, you know, assistance with that anytime soon. No, no, not at all. Yeah, I know a lot of people actually that have switched from some other job involving programming to a cybersecurity firm. Like, they're just popping up everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Christopher Foster writes in and says, Hello, Tom and John. As someone who is in school for networking and will be entering the IT field fairly soon, what would you say as an IT manager's more desirable set of skills certificate? Cisco CCNA or CompTIA Cloud Plus? I plan on getting both at some point, but what certification should I plan to get first? So I, I honestly thought this was the same question. Again, I would say the CompTIA. Uh, mm-hmm. Just because it's got a broader overall skills, um, teaches you a lot about you know managing infrastructure, but also the network. The Cisco plat, the Cisco training will go deeper into managing Cisco and networks and learning Cisco command line and things like that. I guess it comes down to what what he wants to do, you know. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that's all of the reader mails I have. I mean, I guess let me just ask you before we wrap things up. I mean, is there really anything else you want to talk about that we didn't cover, whether it is, you know, what got you into it, upcoming products, even PC gaming? Is there anything you are you want to ask me, anything you want to talk about, or anything you think we didn't cover? I think we um, might have wanted to talk a little bit more about the VMware portion. Okay. Um, I think we covered the, the fact of the licensing change and things, but the move to vSAN for hyperconverge, um, mm-hmm. I would say a lot, much like the change from Intel to AMD, a lot of companies are still looking at hyperconverged as, you know, skeptical. Um, cause it and, I, and to be fair, I don't know pretty much anything about this, though. <laughs> so feel free to say as much or as little as you want explaining it to. So, I mean, it's typically, it's just going, converged is just your standard layers. You got your compute, your networking, and your storage. Uh, mm-hmm. Essentially, what it's doing is just eliminating the network portion and just having it all direct access to the storage. Okay. Um, and one of the things that I really liked about vSAN and, and the hyperconverged is your flexibility. So in terms of like our setup, for example, we have four hosts. And the RAID configuration on it is extremely flexible. Whereas in a standard converged, you have to either set it as RAID 5, RAID 6, or whatever your preference is. But mm-hmm. when you're using vSAN, because it's hyperconverged and it's software RAID, you can pick and choose which VMs have oh. which RAID applied to them. So you can take your production, your most highest priority um, VMs and make sure that they're covered in case of disk mm-hmm. failure. Um, there is some drawbacks. Uh, for RAID 5, you need minimum, I think, three hosts to be able to do it. And RAID 6 requires at least six hosts. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's extra added expense, but the flexibility of it, it was one of the selling points. I actually don't know why they don't market that better um, Personally, it was kind of marketed specifically like VMware. Company, VMware, yeah. So when we we had the VMware rep come over a few years ago, and he was going over vSAN and everything, how it worked, and I looked through their publications, and they didn't really talk about it that much. And and to me, it just seemed like a good selling point because I, you know, you don't necessarily want to have everything on a RAID five or a RAID six. Because you're mm. using no, of ex- course not. It's it is a quite a dilemma, you know. Yeah. Every time you look at which RAID you want to use, it uses extra storage, for example. Mm. So by being able to pick which ones you want, you just consume the amount of space you need for those. 
So it's it's kind of a cost saving too, if you look at it that way. Mm-hmm. And there's really no downsides too, right? Well, I mean, you, you mentioned the host, right? But like in terms of storage, you know, it's an SSD, it's not a hard drive. They can, since it's software based, right? Is that, that's what yeah. you said, right? Right. There's nothing stopping it from constantly making new. Yeah, I didn't know that even exists, right? Because I, I I'm mostly talk about gaming. So yeah, I mean, I mean, that was one of the big advantages too. Is you have direct I/O to the storage mm-hmm. instead of going over one gigabit, ten gigabit network. So the speed you get in the like the speed of a desktop with an NVMe in it, it's, it's fantastic. But the other thing that I was gonna mention, with, particularly with vSAN, is the way. Uh, see if I can word this right. Okay. <laughs> the way it's structured, if you're moving from one VMware platform to another, so you're just upgrading but changing infrastructure type from Converge mm-hmm. to Hyper. If you have something like Veeam, which we have, it's so easy to migrate across. Literally, you just back up your VMs, set up your new infrastructure, and move them across. And that's it, you're done. Mm hmm. You know, where I think with an old one, it would be a little bit more complicated. But it's it's so smart as well with all the other built-in functions of VMware vCenter, uh, DR, DRS, you know, automatic failover and everything. So I think for anybody doing a refresh, should consider moving to hyperconverged. Not just considering Intel to AMD, but hyperconverged mm-hmm. is definitely where technology is going to for the server infrastructure. Well, as someone who is not in any way well-equipped to comment on what I think about that, <laughs> I will say you've convinced me that that is something that's probably highly overlooked if that really is that easy to do. And is, I mean, again, if, it, if it, I mean, ideally you turn every resource you have into a faucet, need more speed, you know, and it sounds like that's what it allows you to do with storage, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like how much speed do you actually need for each application? Uh, being uh, that people are using over the cloud. Yeah, and, and the, to my comment earlier, you know, like like I said, instead of upgrading CPUs to higher core count, we would just mm. add a host, and it it is so simple with vSAN because you're just adding a host and adding that capacity tier to your environment. Mm-hmm. So it's it's pretty simple to manage. Okay. Well, I mean, I do think that's interesting. Was there anything else you wanted to discuss? Not off the top of my head, no. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this. You're, you're in Illinois like me, right? Correct, yeah. How cold is it where you are right now? I believe it's minus six, maybe minus eight. Yeah, I mean, I think, because you're a bit north of me. Yeah, it's almost zero here down in Peoria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sick of the snow right now. And we don't have a well, snowblower. Well, it was getting so. warmer for the past week. And then out of nowhere, it's like, hey, guess what? It's going to be negative 10 tonight. <laughs> <laughs> And, that, and then I looked at the forecast, and it's like, oh, no, it's going to be this cold for the next two weeks. And I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah, that's one of the drawbacks of living in Illinois, I guess. Well, I may, I may be considering moving, though, but I'm not going to announce that yet to the channel. Although I guess everyone just heard me say that. But uh, you can you're that stuck out. here, though, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess that's all there. I guess what I'm kind of leading to as well is I turn off my heat while I record for absolute silence in my house. And it is, I mean, I can't see my breath yet, but I think my pipes will freeze pretty soon <laughs> if I don't turn the heat back on. So, I mean, I, I do want to thank you for coming on. Is there anything you want to plug? You know, I've, I, I ask that. This isn't exactly like a comedy podcast, but like, is there anything you want to plug or something? Uh, no, uh, just thanks for having me on. No, again, mm-hmm. big fan of the channel. Always keep up with it. And if you ever want me to come on for any sort of collaboration or anything, just let me know. I'll be happy to. Yeah, I was thinking that while we were talking to, it might be an interesting idea if I have someone on to bring in someone like you, even just in the background to correct things <laughs> <laughs> or ask good questions sometimes. Uh, because I think sometimes I bring on experts and I think I am, I think, if I may say, pretty good at interviewing people, but sometimes I might not always have the, I might have a good question, but I might not have a good follow-up to that question because it's not what I do, right? Okay. So yeah, we'll, 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 we'll think about that, but don't, don't, you know what? Don't get ahead of yourself though. That's not <laughs> my show, so I'll invite you if I want to. <laughs> But uh, yeah, all right. So uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you to everyone for listening. Uh, have a good uh, 
evening, day, or morning, everybody. The following podcast was brought to you by the YouTube channel and website, Moore's Law is Dead. Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon are trademarks of their creator, Tom. That guy is me, and I am indeed the creator, editor, writer, and showrunner of Moore's Law is Dead podcast, videos, articles, and other media. However, Moore's Law is Dead is a team with Broken Silicon co-hosted by my brother, Dan, audio editing by Gerard Cortez, and select technical editing by Carbon Cry. You can find all of our information, including how to get a hold of us, at www.moreslawsdead.com. And if you are a fan and would like to send mail or other hardware, please mail parcels to Moore's Laws Dead, P.O. Box 10468, Peoria, Illinois, 61612. And speaking of fans, without exaggeration, the patrons are responsible for the continued distribution of the content you just listened to. And so if you have some extra money, but only if you do, please consider supporting us. For just $2 a month, you get access to the exclusive podcast, Die Shrink, voting on subjects of future podcast episodes, the ability to have your questions read aloud on Broken Silicon, Die Shrink, and Loose Ends, and of course, the Moore's Law is Dead Discord full of like-minded people who would love to meet you. I am one of them. And at higher tiers, you get access to ad-free episodes of Broken Silicon, the back catalog of Flyover States podcast, thanks in the credits of videos and podcasts and other perks as well. And if you cannot afford to support us, please just share Moore's Law is Dead videos and podcasts with friends and family on social media and Reddit. And give Broken Silicon and Flyover States a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. All of this really does help so much more than I think anyone realizes. If you'd like to advertise on the podcast or a person of interest who would like to be a guest, please reach out to the email address mlhbdead at gmail.com. But as I said, this podcast would not be possible without its fans supporting it. And so now it is time to give a personal thanks to the greatest of the fans. The following supporters are at the 10 gigahertz or higher producer levels. Matthew McMullen, Telos, GUK, Benny Berlin, Justin Yant, Thomas Rupp, I love you, Lynn and Jim, Ivan K, Tom Bailey, Muhammad al Khwari, Frederick Lau, James Krasta, Justin Parrish, Zachary Martin, Terrence Aaron, Brad Medlin, Phil S, Courtney Elliott, The Ninth Dude, Greg Renegar, Josh Law, JBG, Travis Gooding, The Mechanical Philosopher, Lebo Kinkilo, Fatboy Disru, Daniel Hyde, Burt Garcia, Tara Reed, Jack O'Neill, Matt Salem, Aaron Close, Juan Garcia, Sean Balmer, My Name Is Nobody, Robert Alethros, Telos, Hey There's a Kitty, Greg T. Wanjik, Ivan 214, John Jameson, Benjamin Cannon, Matthew Lane, Divider Symbol, Jan Round, Rubber Duck, Street of Full, Ali Robertson, Eric Jackson, Jonathan, Patrick Groh, Evan Dingle, Dominique Cox, Stefan, Original Ross, HardForeRoom.com, Sam MacArthur, Total Silo, Sol Connor, Michael Casa, Andrew S., Blake, Aaron Keith, Kerry Baldino, Endless Loggins, Tom San Filippo, Justice Brennan, Viking R., Trevor Powers, Stu, Alenia, Nanyan, Daniel Nishpal, Franco Frederick, Hardware Numbers, Alex Carasil, Dark Rain 2049, Lane Perry, Joseph Caraman, Carlos Valdez, Carnivore Bear, Luca, Zebra Z Birds, Licky, Matt and Porchegi, David Cowden, Ricky Tan, Granadin, Patrick J.S., Justin Staples, Freddie Canoas Jr., Christopher Foster, Kiwi Phil, Dahoo Sarah Light, Anthony Gareffa, Matthew Griffin, Alex, Joseph Floria, Luis Correa, Deke, Cheesy Robin, Raul Abeneni, Tim Robbins, Jake223, Brian Riggleman, Chris Williams, Ryan Deniskew, Dave McCoy, Valko Malev, Gabe Lagner, Paul B., Morton Svensson, Andrew, Thomas Summers, Maurice Courtois, Matthew J. Ling, Scott Ref Schneider, Mai Sharona, Aaron, Roman, Jacob Stankiewicz, Jake Pym, Rakir Khan, Ashil Dar Epstein, Stephen Hart, Christopher A. Butler, Charles Antoine Futeau, Peter Moore, Chris Lakata, Justin Thomas, Sam Miller, James Kitchens, Kevin Chen, Shakir, Nick Rakin, Holden Mobley, Matthew Lazier, Arpit Sharma, Mead and Pork, Jimmy NG, Shakir Mads, and of course, thank you to Sahara for the music. <laughs>